the first day of hearings before a House Joint Subcommittee. Chairing the hearing, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. Subcommittees will now come to order. Release that just went out through AP. Um, I think I think what is important, and I think he and I and all of us here uh, need to get to the bottom of what the business is that we're here for. And the bottom is that we need. Let me just finish. Uh, we need we need to find the truth, and we need to get away from any outside influences that could affect that. So I just want to compliment you, just as I did uh, Louis Free last week when he took the courageous move of op reopening Ruby Ridge, and I think that was also courageous. Could I get now, like, time now? Well, actually, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barr has the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Evans, uh, how many years have you been practicing law? A little over 25. Sorry, a little over 25. And uh, has that been uh, specializing in criminal law? That's all I've done for that. Both civil, a I mean, both uh, federal and state? Yes. Are you familiar with uh, the bail procedures and the Bail Reform Act in federal courts? Yes, I am. Are you familiar with testimony here today uh, regarding uh, David Koresh leaving the compound and the reasons why he was not apprehended or why no effort was made to apprehend him away from the compound and references to him getting right back out on bond? Yes, I've heard a lot of that. Does that comport with your understanding of uh, the Bail Reform Act? Absolutely not, and it's very misleading because the Bail Reform Act says you can detain persons without bond for a variety of reasons, but one of them is if they might be a danger to the community. And the government gets to file a, uh, a notice of that, and then they get three days to prepare for a hearing. So anybody that gets arrested in the federal system is, is looking at three days in jail without and any Is bail. there any doubt at all in your mind that, uh, that Mr. Koresh, had he been awasted, uh, arrested, away from the compound would have been detained by a federal magistrate. Well, the greatest proof of that is that every person that was on trial had been detained for a year before they went to trial. So these people, these other people were detained. Surely David Koresh would have been. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'm going to go down to your charts here. We have heard a great deal about tape, and I want to show the American public some tape. We have documents here, this first one talks about a directive from the government of the United States of America directing that no interviews and no discussions with any participants who might be potential witnesses are to be conducted, hoping that the passage of time will dim memories. That is tape. Our Department of Justice of the United States of America is directing that the Treasury Department of the United States of America not conduct interviews to get at the truth. You want taint? That's taint. Our government, in response to the ATF carrying out a legitimate, in due course, investigation of what went wrong on February 28th, is being told by the Assistant United States Attorney of the United States Department of Justice to stop the ATF shooting review, which we have heard by experts is designed to get at the truth, to find out what went wrong and why. They are being told to stop the interviews, and those that must go forward, go forward without notes being created. You want taint? That's taint. When the government conducted, began conducting before the cover-up, its shooting review, it was immediately determined that the stories did not add up. And then the interviews were told, the interviewees 
were told by the Department of Justice representative, don't go further. You want taint? That's taint. What I would like to do at this point, Mr. Evans, is go back to you and give us your expert opinion as to whether or not this represents standard operating procedures for the Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury in conducting investigations of potential wrongdoing. Well, if it does, we're all in a lot of big, big trouble. Because people that are on trial, and there might be something to show that they're really innocent, that evidence would never come out, because we'd never know about it. Have you ever, in your 25 years of handling cases, including many involving criminal cases involving the United States Department of Justice in federal court, seen documents as explicit as these in directing that interviews not be conducted because they may turn up evidence of innocence? Never have I seen documents that explicit. Do you ever hope to see such a thing again? Only if it happens again. Because if we couldn't find it out, we'd never know. And the trouble is, we didn't ever, we, the defense lawyers, never got those documents. But you did through this hearing. Through this hearing. And I, I saw them for the first time sitting on the front row here two days ago. I didn't come up here to talk about those documents. I just saw them after I got here. Chair yields to Mr. Conyers for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Counsel Evans, uh, did you examine the uh, search warrant in this matter? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, did you challenge its validity? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. Did you think that it was valid? Two reasons I didn't. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Just I, the, the I question. Understand about the question the question is, I'll did you it. think that it was valid? I thought it was probably legally sufficient. Okay. And so, yes, I'll right. spot you probable call. That's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Is that the same thing as good enough for government work? Uh, I don't need any more comments, counsel. I'm sorry. I'm going to someone else. Uh, Mr. Coleman, uh, you have a military background in addition to your uh, current I position. I have some, sir, but uh, predominantly my experience has been within... Uh, civilian law enforcement mm -hmm. tactical operations. Do you, do you have a familiarity in conducting the review to be able to comment about the uh, CS gas and its use in this incident? Well, of course, our charter was not to look at anything that uh, took place subsequent to the release of responsibility to the FBI. Uh, so I can't comment with any uh, personal knowledge in terms of what they did or why the UCS. I do have an opinion based upon my experience, however, well, uh, well, concerning we're, we're CS. We're going to go into detail about it in another panel, but what's your general familiarity with it? I mean, what, what, is, what is the circumstance in which it can be used? And Generally speaking, uh, CS, tearing agent, because gas is a misnomer. It is not a gas. It's a particulate matter. Uh, is utilized in either crowd and riot control situations or in situations involving barricaded criminal suspects. Do you know anything about its uh, health hazards or potential health hazards? I have utilized CS myself. I have seen it used in literally hundreds of cases, both in crowd and riot control situations as well as barricade situations. I have never, ever seen in all of that experience anyone suffer any health hazards or become injured as a result of it. I'm acquainted with a British study that has held over the years of, of looking and researching into the use of CS mm -hmm. that people who have previous healthy conditions will suffer no harm from the use of CS. People that were previously in bad health could perhaps have an episode just as it would be prompted, for example, uh, if a person had seizure disorders, of pressure might cause them to have a seizure. And the mm -hmm. use of CS because of that additional pressure could, of course, cause them to perhaps have an episode. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. With reference to the uh, use of flashbangs, the, the noise devices, uh, do you have any experience that would lead you to believe it may not be dangerous? 
I'm sorry, sir. I did. Did you say? Do you that think they the flashbangs are dangerous to children or not? It depends upon how they're utilized. If they're utilized properly, they are in fact a proven life-saving device. They're designed to be utilized to distract the criminal suspect uh, or someone that perhaps is mentally deranged, so that a few extra seconds can be gained, so that the entry team or the police officers or federal agents can hopefully take that person into custody before they arm themselves or before they utilize those uh, items of weaponry against law enforcement. In effect, what you're doing is preventing a shooting and make it, making it safer for those involved Finally, on both sides. Finally, isn't dynamic uh, entry, uh, doesn't that contain the element of surprise as an important factor? Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, it would be hard for me to imagine uh, a dynamic entry without an element of surprise. I guess maybe you could do it without it, but it, it seems to me that that would normally accompany the uh, circumstances around using dynamic entry. That's correct, sir. And, and I think there's been a lot of uh, misunderstanding about the term dynamic entry, and I know uh, some confusion about what it consists of. A dynamic entry is nothing more than a vigorous, sudden, unexpected entry. And the term unexpected entry, of course, implies the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. And it is very essential. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Coleman. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boyer from Indiana, five minutes. Boyer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I, uh, I actually, I just want to make some, some, uh, a few comments. And one thing I, I, I guess I'll share, I, Yesterday in the morning, I shared with some of my colleagues here about uh, my experiences of growing up on the Tippecanoe River and what that meant, and what a shallow river is, and what a deep river is. Uh, I guess I have a, uh, I still am young when it comes to, uh, to this town. Young in that, uh, having been in this town for now two and a half years, I still have a bit of naivety. Naivety in, in that I think that. Uh, that Congress can conduct its oversight responsibilities, that uh, we can begin to really look into things, that there really are separations of power, that there are legitimate roles and duties for us to undertake, and that we can do that uh, free of any forms of taint. And I've heard uh, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Conyers, and others talk about this cloud over the proceedings and whether they're tainted in any way. And they reach so far as some form of a, uh, uh, you know, some, ind some independent counsel out there that may have been paid by the uh, NRA, but you know, th th to me, it's extremely uh, uh, disappointing uh, on, on the AP article that was mentioned. But you know, one thing I, I have to kind of kind of joke about is that you know th there is the federal statute that was read earlier about uh, uh, tampering with a witness or or uh, forms of intimidation, and for the uh, the Treasury Secretary, who's now in charge of the ATF, to in fact call a member of his own party. Uh, informs to, uh, to, hey, let's not try to embarrass the administration or federal agencies. The problem here is, is uh, I don't think anybody could ever intimidate Mr. Brewster. Uh, you are, you're quite a uh, gentleman. A and uh, um, I just think that uh, it's a disappointing the administration would do that. And I think that uh, hopefully Mr. Rubin will uh, clear the air uh, somewhat on uh, what in fact had, uh, had occurred uh, because if there was a cloud, that in fact uh, would be one. I, I'd like to yield to uh, to Mr. Henry Hyde, uh, the rain balance of my time. Well, I thank you, uh, uh, and and uh, it just seems to me that to some people this is a PR exercise, and and rather than a serious inquiry into the truth, and uh, maybe we can put aside all of these diversions and proceed to find out what the facts are. Ms. Barks, I listened to you talk about your understanding of the Branch Davidians theology. And you've studied it, I take it. Yes. Did anybody ask you for your opinions during this uh, siege of 51 days uh, as to what David Koresh was all about and, and what their attitudes were towards coming out as we played records of uh, rabbits being slain and, and, and rock music and whatever else. Did anyone ask you for your assistance on the, the theology that was driving these people? No, sir. I, I gave information as I could. Sometimes that was kind of difficult to everybody 
had their own task and it was real hard to disseminate information. I had the number for the negotiators and there were a couple times when I felt like there was something significant, but it, it was pretty frustrating. Um, it is factual that the negotiators and those people in charge of this event totally misunderstood the theological basis for what the Davidians were doing, resisting. Uh, the Babylonians were going to kill them. They were going to die and they couldn't go to Jerusalem until they did die. But they had to fight like it was Armageddon to get the hosts of God down. Uh, and all of that would have been terribly important in understanding how to avoid the immolation that occurred with 86 people. Isn't that true? That's true. Nobody, you couldn't get through to anybody, could you? Well, I thought at one point I got through. Um, my husband didn't understand it either. And, and uh, as I used the scriptures that David had given me over the months, we started trying to put together something. And an FBI agent asked for that document, and I provided it. It's pretty clear about what I thought was going to happen. We just went at it exactly wrong. Uh, to, to, to get them out, you don't hurl gas in and try to drive them out with noise. You talk to them on the basis of the scriptures. Isn't that correct? That's correct. What, what happened to them meant it was fulfillment of the pro prophecy. Sure. When the 70 uh, SWAT team, the 70, uh, with their, their helmets on and their guns, I mean, this was it. This was a fulfillment of the scriptures. But they had to fight back, and nobody understood that, did they? Well, they, they were, you under, have to understand that they were looking forward to that. Because no, we're talk, you're talking about the Davidians. Yes. I'm talking about on our side, the, the uh, servers of the warrants and the search warrant. Nobody understood really what was driving these people. I tried to communicate it, and I, I thought I was heard. I think part of that information got passed on. I was really angry after the raid. And uh, I talked. Because it was avoidable. Yes. Had, had somebody really known what they were doing, right? The, pre the, the result was very predictable. I thank the gentlelady. Chair yields to Mrs. Scott. Five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Evans. Um, Back to the search warrant, I believe, based on my reading of the affidavit, that there was plenty there to support probable cause for the um, arrest and search. Uh, if you could show that the search was, that the warrant was defective and that the search was illegal, uh, but done in probable cause with, um, with good faith by the police, but executed in good faith by the police officers, uh, what constructive purpose would have been served by um, a motion to suppress? It wouldn't have helped us under the current state of the law because all the police officers have to say was, I didn't know that warrant was bad. Uh, I thought it was good. The judge signed it. And once they say that, uh, then anybody's going to find good faith and boom. So uh, even the if, issue's over. So even if it were an illegal warrant, there'd be no constructive purpose to be served to go forward with a motion to suppress? No, sir. Uh, not under the current status of the law. Now, you might do it to hope that someday the Supreme Court would, would help you on that issue. Before the Leon decision, you could have made a motion to suppress. Is that right? Oh, yeah, and, and did frequently. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time to the uh, gentlelady from Illinois. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, Ms. Sparks, I didn't get a chance to finish asking the questions that I wanted to ask you about the theology that the David Divinians had. And uh, one of the things that we were talking about was Psalms 45, and I'm going to read to you some of the verses of Psalm 45. From the, uh, the New King, uh, John, uh, King James Version says, You love righteousness and hate wickedness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Listen, O daughters, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you with gladness and rejoicing. They shall be brought. Now, what exactly did he take from those passages that you thought would encourage him to do the things he did to young children 
and to young, young, young girls. Well, you have to remember that he was a very intelligent man. He didn't, he didn't give you direct statements about the fact that he was sleeping with young girls. What he did was read those passages and then make comments about being the lamb and that this, this is the scripture. So he never actually said it. He just used the scriptures to tell you what was right and what he thought the law was. And people believe that because he read the scripture and they saw into that because of his urging that it was all right for him to, to uh, abuse young women, young girls? Yes, ma'am. The men actually gave up their own wives to him. They believed it very strongly. And is that because he, he was, so over, was such an overpowering personality that they did that? He, he was a very personable man, but when he was intense, he was frightening. Uh, he would get real intense looking at you, and his voice would raise in a kind of a threatening manner. And uh, he was just very, um, he felt threatening. And so he felt that the glories of the Messiah and his bride, were, they were all his glories, and all the brides were his, is that it? That's correct. And all the, the, uh, the virgins were also his? That's right. All the women belonged to him. And, and, and therefore, that made everything all right in his kingdom on Mount Carmel. Remember, he thought he was the law, so he didn't have to answer to anyone because he was the law. And so anything he did, I mean, he wrote the book, he was the Lamb of God, so his interpretation was beyond question for him. I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you. It's your turn. Th thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to ask Mr. Oborski um, a question. He, Mr. Um, Secretary Benston went to great length to say what they had done after the fact <clears throat> to cure the problems that had happened. I was wondering if you could um, tell us what kinds of things we could look at in advance to measure whether or not we are properly prepared for these kinds of raids. I understand that this was somewhat unprecedented um, in the um, AFT, where, um, a ATF, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> and they were not prepared for the raid. Um, and they have subsequently upgraded their training and whatnot. Uh, what kinds of things should we look to to make sure that we don't get into this same kind of situation again? Well, very briefly, <coughs> what you have to look at is the intelligence gathering. You have to look at the type of training. We also have to look at the type of weapons that we're facing today. I heard somebody talk about Darth Vader helmets, and I heard we've been called jackbooted, and we wear Nazi helmets. Those helmets protect us. We want to go home at night. And we're facing assault weapons, we have to wear those helmets. So people have, we have to realize that law enforcement, the face of law enforcement has changed. We may not look like the way they look, but that's the way we look, because we want to survive the end of the day. So we have to look at equipment. We have to look at intelligence. We have to look at who's stockpiling weapons, for what purpose. Are there other cults out there? Are there other groups out there? And are we prepared to face another standoff? Do we have the behavioral science people? Do we have the people we can call upon to say, what's wrong with those people in there? How come they're not listening to us? What's going on? What do you think is in their mind? But most importantly, we have to protect the public. And that's where we stand. We stand between the Koreshes of the world and everybody here. We stand there, law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fired. Uh, Mr. Ehrlich, five minutes. Chairman, I will uh, be pleased to yield my five minutes to my friend and colleague, Mr. Bryant. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sparks, I want to ask you just a few questions, if I might begin with you. Uh, you work for the state of Texas, and as I understand, you were out in the Mount Carmel campaign uh, camp compound two or three times during three the times. course. Three <coughs> times. Yes, were you allowed please. inside? Yes. Were you allowed to question people, adults, both adults and children? We had somewhat limited access, but we were allowed to question some. <coughs> did, um, uh, 
Did you have any problem going in there? No, we didn't. We were, we were invited in. When the uh, Agent Aguilara proposed to you the idea of perhaps assisting them in luring him outside, uh, I understand that you offered to do that. Yes, I did. Initially, but as it went up your chain of command, uh, your supervisor decided that you would not do that. That's correct. Would your decision to cooperate in trying to get Mr. Koresh outside the compound for the purposes of these agents arresting him, <coughs> uh, would that have been colored by the fact that you were familiar with his uh, charismatic effect over the people there, and perhaps if he were separated, that uh, it would be easier to take both sides down, so to speak? Yes, I had a, a pretty good working relationship with David Koresh. I mean, we, we discussed scriptures, and um, he, he was very open to meeting with me. But it was your feeling that once, again, separated from their leader, that uh, it was your feeling that the people in the compound that were left back there were less likely to resist that's right, because they had to all be together for the prophecy to be fulfilled. Now, uh, there have been a number of allegations. We've had uh, graphic testimony from a young lady who came in here and, uh, in, in my view, was exploited uh, publicly uh, back in my home state. Uh, we don't even print the names of minors in that type of situation. And, and to go on public television and, and, and said what she did, uh, I, I think, was some type of exploitation. But were there any... Were there any state charges? Were these advancing? Uh, this, you know, sec, uh, this type of charge was not a federal offense. You know that. Yes. Were there efforts being made to process or prosecute these folks, and Mr. Koresh in particular, within the state of Texas? I interviewed the child. Um, she was afraid of David Koresh and didn't, she was afraid to testify, so they, they didn't move forward on it. What, what about the other children, though? We didn't have enough information. We didn't get a, a good investigation because we, didn't, we had limited access. As I understand now, let me skip forward just a little bit because my time is getting short. The CS gas has been mentioned, and uh, based on what you know of CS gas, would you have recommended that they put this inside that compound with those children and the elderly people there? I don't know very much about CS gas at all. I had one conversation with, a, with an agent about it and asked some questions about it and what he told me is basically all I know. My concern was that I, I knew when I was there there were propane tanks in the hallway and I wondered if that was going to present a problem. Did you pass along this information? I had a discussion about what, what would it do and how would it affect, yes. Were you asked by the FBI to set up a, a contingency uh, plan to, for CS gas? Uh, on children to have showers and, and treatment set up for them? Yes, that was uh, a week or more prior to the, to the actual fire. And to be clear, that was the second and final raid back in April. Not, not this first entry in February, but back in uh, April. Yes. And uh, did they follow up with you and did you in fact do this? The, we discussed all the tactics that we would use. I was supposed to meet with the medical team that evening about 5.30, I got a call, and they said, for, you know, forget it. Forget all about it. Don't even think about it. Now and who we is never, they? Who it, told it you It was this? the ATF agent who called from the command post. And again, this is in April, prior to the second dynamic entry. Actually, I think it was more like the end of March. I, I couldn't find my notes. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, other questions, but there for other witnesses. Uh, could you want to continue at this point? Uh, no, I believe your time has expired. And uh, we'll move on to uh, recognize the lady from Texas, Sh Sheila Jackson Lee. Not here? OK. Uh, do you have the minority have someone else they'd rather? Oh, OK. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know the bells have rung, and I'm not sure what I'll, what I'll be able to finish. I what believe we, we, you, you'll get your five minutes in. All right. uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Uh, Sparks, uh, if I could, uh, simply to uh, pursue a line of questioning uh, that deals with children. And I know there have been several questions about the women. Um, but was it your sense that even the children and their young minds might have been 
I may use the term mesmerized, if you have a better term, uh, by the words or teachings of uh, this individual, Mr. Koresh. Yes, they were, they were uh, very clear in their belief that he was the lamb. As a matter of fact, the, the girl that you've heard from already, when I interviewed her, she said, I said, how did you feel when this was going on? And she said, well, I, I felt scared, but I also felt privileged. So if we are in uh, these hearings uh, to provide corrective measures uh, to ensure that this tragedy does not happen again, and we heard um, a, very, um, a fairly extensive list by uh, my colleague, Mr. Lantos, about various sects, S-E-C-T, whether it be uh, in Japan or elsewhere, they do exist. And so this is an important component for law enforcement maybe to understand. Because as I hear you uh, speaking, uh, heard your testimony, it seems that these were even young children that seem to have been under this, I will just say, spell. Uh, is that accurate, even the young children? The, the young children were real clear that David was in charge. And did you see any progression as they got older, maybe 10, 11, 12, 15, uh, the teenagers? Well, I think the older children were a little bit more well-versed in how to talk to us when we came. They knew how to confuse the enemy, as David would say. So they were, they were more cautious in their words. As a solution then, what would you offer for uh, advanced training or additional training for law enforcement dealing with these exceptional type groups? Well, I guess training for law enforcement wouldn't be my first choice. It would be to say there, there needs to be a collaboration um, of different people who have expertise in whatever sect you're, you're looking at. Uh, so if we, would, if we were to offer, excuse me for interrupting you, but if we were to offer a corrective measure, you'd emphasize collaboration and knowledge and that at least they would participate with any who had the expertise, real expertise, about these very uh, different circumstances. Is that my understanding? Yes. When you, when you know that you have information that's helpful and it, you can't get it to the person who needs it, it's very frustrating. I thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Obojski, do I have that correct, sir, I hope? Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, we have, over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, I've been listening to uh, a great deal of discussion on talk radio I hold in the highest uh, uh, level of respect it communicates to Americans. But we've heard uh, uh, one of the gentlemen, and, and maybe this has been said, but I want to emphasize it even more, uh, G. Gordon Liddy uh, talked about uh, this whole idea of uh, shooting uh, in the head. But I want to get to the point of the kinds of equipment um, that has to be worn. And I know that uh, you've answered it. Uh, in a manner that explains some of the type of uh, equipment. Uh, I've heard ninja type uh, suits being used, but more importantly, uh, are we in a different era? Uh, because we have the privileges of the First Amendment in this nation, and it seems that people have taken a different tone, does that not even require more safety and, and equipment that that protects individuals who I would hope have the first responsibility of saving lives themselves and protecting themselves. Yes, ma'am, without a doubt. The day of a couple of agents or a couple of detectives walking up to somebody's front door and knocking on a door in three-piece suits to execute a warrant of any kind is over. Not with the proliferation of firearms we have today, not with the type of weapons we find all over this country urban and suburban America, assault rifles converted to automatic machine guns, 9 millimeter handguns with banana clips. We are, we are really at danger out there. Ms. Olivia's remarks do not help any. Encouraging people to shoot ATF agents in the head because they're wearing bulletproof vests, obviously we have to go out there with helmets on. We have to wear this type of gear because of the type of people that we are dealing with. We are not dealing with people carry, carrying Saturday night specials. We also have to wear protective goggles because a lot of times we go in, we have things thrown in our face. We have a very aggressive criminal element out there. 
I, I, thank, I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oborski, and I, I thank, Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I think uh, even at uh, Waco, some were shot in the head, as I understand, ATF officers. I think I understood that to be true. General Lady's time has expired. I'll, you. I'll tell you, before we uh, uh, recess, uh, I'm going to yield to Mr. Micah for one second. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I'd like to yield my time to you when you return. Thank you very much. Uh, what we will be doing, this is the last time we'll be interrupted. Uh, we have, I believe, two votes. Uh, we will go and vote, and we'll return here five minutes after the second vote, and we'll be here for the rest of the evening without interruption for those that remain to stay. We is it more than... amendments, and then probably final passage. Okay, so whatever the amount of votes is, we'll be back after five minutes after the last one to resume. Thank you very much. Stand to recess. We'll continue with this Waco hearing in just a moment, but first, some program information. Coming up this weekend on C-SPAN. Saturday on America and the Courts, we mark the five-year anniversary of Justice William Brennan's retirement, with speeches by Justice Brennan and comments by his law clerks. Also Saturday, a review of the Persian Gulf War. Former Bush administration officials James Baker, Dick Cheney, and Brent Scowcroft speak about what they learned from the war. Next, peacemaking, a speech by Washington Post columnist Coleman McCarthy at Georgetown University. Sunday on Book Notes, House Speaker Newt Gingrich in his book, To Renew America. Our public affairs programming continues this weekend with America and the Courts, Saturday at 7. Then a review of the Persian Gulf War at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Also Saturday night, a speech by columnist Coleman McCarthy at 9 Eastern and Pacific Time. Sunday night, book notes with Newt Gingrich at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. C-SPAN's online guide to government is available on your personal computer through America Online. It includes photos and biographies of members of Congress, information about how the House and Senate work, and congressional schedules. AOL subscribers use the keyword C-SPAN. C-SPAN, a public service created by America's cable television companies. We continue now with Waco investigation, the first day of hearings before a House Joint Subcommittee. Chairing the hearing, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. Subcommittees will now come to order. You can, you can yield. Chair yields to Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we resume after voting here. And, uh, so I'm not sure we have a. Can we wait to start my time until we get a complete panel? I think we're uh, okay. I have questions for Mr. Morrison, and he well, that's as complete as I need right now. If you don't mind, Mr. Evans. We can go ahead and start, Mr. Morrison. Let me follow up with some questions. I know you've testified before this panel yesterday, and I express concern over the issue of the uh, the the lack of the element of surprise in this raid. And we have talked uh, to a couple of panels since that time, and we've had 
uh, from the actual uh, participants and their superiors different stories as to what they should have done uh, when the element of surprise was lost in this raid, the initial thrust on uh, February 28, 1993. And as I mentioned yesterday, as a former Army prosecutor and former U.S. attorney and a, and a defender of sheriffs and civil litigation during my career, I'm very much aware when you go out there on a raid such as this and you lose the element of surprise, there are only two things that can happen. One's good and one's bad. The good thing is the person there accepts the warrant peacefully. The bad thing is what happened here at Waco and caused the loss of four people and, and 20 people injured on the ATF side and ultimately led to the second disaster when the, uh, the civilians were lost in April. I wanted to ask you if you could tell me uh, how important, well, let me, let me back up and ask it this way. In the context of serving a warrant, in this case, they had an arrest warrant for David Koresh, and they had a search warrant for the 77 acres, the property there. They could have been served separately, could they not? Yes, sir. You that's, could catch that's, Mr. That's Koresh. legally possible, yes, sir. You could catch Mr. Koresh off the compound and serve the arrest warrant on him and arrest him, and then subsequently go out and serve the search warrant on the property, which that had to be done. Yes, sir. Now, in a dynamic raid, a dynamic attack such as this, in the context of serving warrants, where do the warrants go? Who's got the warrants and where is that person? Well, the, uh, it depends on the jurisdiction. I'm not totally familiar with the restrictions on the federal agencies, but you have to get basically a no-knock warrant in the state of California. You have to have that by the judge. You have to explain the need for the, the type of service that you're going to do. If you do not have that legal condition in the service of the warrant, then the dynamic entry is not an option that you have. So uh, you're limited by the legal considerations. If, if you develop uh, to the satisfaction of the court the need for surprise, then you have the warrant in your back pocket, basically, but you're not serving it on anybody until you make entry. Was the object here on February 28, 1993, to not knock, but rather go up and kick the door down and go in? The, was there the, the object here was, was to go in. Uh, I believe that the warrant provided for a no-knock entry. And, and would the, where would the warrant have been in that situation? Where should the warrant have been? Did it make any difference? The warrant would be with, with the serving or with the responding agency, with, in this case with ATF, and there would be somebody designated to have the warrant or the warrant information. But isn't the warrant normally carried to the door? I mean, what, what if Mr. Koresh had come to the door and said, okay, I'm here, what, what have you got for me? Should not that person I'm, have given I'm him not, a warrant I'm at that not time? Legally, or I'm not experienced and qualified to answer for the uh, federal side of the house. I, my whole experience has been in state and local government. I can only speak from my knowledge of California. I, I'm not trying to be evasive there, okay, sir. I think you need fine. to ask a federal agent that. But at a, as a, at a minimum, the tactical side of this, uh, this raid should have had clear guidance on, on the possibility of aborting that raid and when they could have done it in the event the element of surprise was lost. That should have been a clear message up and down the chain of command, should it not? That should, ordinarily, the standard is that that's part of the tactical plan. When the tactical plan is improved and if it's going to be a dynamic entry, you lose the element of surprise, you normally will abort the dynamic entry unless you have a well clearly developed contingency plan for an alternate means to do that. Did you see any of those in, in this particular incident, in this particular plan? Well, let me answer that by saying what I was aware of. I believe the element of surprise was critical to the service of this warrant. I believe the element of surprise was lost. And I believe that the raid should have been aborted. Could I ask Mr. Evans that same question, if you followed me? I, I'm sorry, I did not. <laughs> okay. All right, I was asking about the element of surprise in terms of the warrant and uh, oh. the issue of aborting the raid when that element was lost. Uh, well, I need to correct one thing. This, there was not permission for a no-knock given in this warrant. We did have a hearing in court about that issue. The warrant was not a no-knock warrant. So what would have been the proper process then for service of this warrant? I, I, I let you go to finish up one, but when you start jumping on another one, I have to, uh, have to call it. Uh, Mr. Condit from California, you have five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like uh, the records to, uh, to indicate I have been on the floor for the last couple of hours debating and participating in the Ag Appropriations uh, Bill that's on the floor. I have not been here. I apologize to the witnesses. I apologize to you, but it was necessary for me to be on the floor. After saying that and putting yes, that very much noted, thank you. I would like to yield to uh, my colleague, Mr. Brewster, for, uh, from Oklahoma, to, for my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connie. Would you also like to mention that your amendments won? <laughs> uh, Mr. Honoski, uh, you made a point in your statement a moment ago that I brought up a couple of times with other people. David Koresh was not a good guy. I think anybody that's listened to what's gone on has to believe that at this point. I think there's certainly ample evidence that everyone should understand there's a high likelihood that he had converted semi-automatic weapons into fully automatic weapons. Yet it amazes me that ATF agents were asked to go in there uh, under armed, in my opinion. Uh, I've had a chance to go out to Quantico and uh, shoot uh, some fully automatic weapons the FBI has and some other federal agencies. And it amazes me that your people went in there uh, armed much less than the people who were in the compound. I believe that the plan was to get in there as quickly as possible, even though they did not have a no-knock warrant, and to get between the men and the firearms. But I would like to add the fact that we do this every day. This is nothing new. We do this every single day. We go in out there with warrants, knock, announce, when we don't get the proper response, we knock the door down and we try and get in there as quick as possible to separate the bad guy from the bad weapons that will be used against us. This is nothing new. This goes on every single day. State, local, and federal law enforcement, ATF, makes hundreds and hundreds of arrests like this. But now, wait a minute. You don't every day go into a compound that has three or four hundred uh, weapons and 75 or 80 people. Uh, you do make raids every day. You do a lot of good things in separating criminals from weapons. But I don't think every day you go into a compound such as this. And my point is, uh, you don't have to use fully automatic weapons, but you need to have the capability in case something goes wrong. You're, my you're, goodness. You're, you're absolutely right. You had no place to hide looking at the area around the building and you weren't armed as well as the guy inside. You, there's you're there's got to be a contingency plan. You're absolutely right. Uh, I believe one of the problems that ATF faced at that compound was the structure itself. That if you go in with an overwhelming firepower with fully automatic weapons and start spraying bullets all over the place, then you would have had children laying all over the place I agree. With bullets. You should not do that. So, so you, have to, you have to strike a balance. Absolutely. Where I work in New York City, we're deathly afraid of firing a round that's going to go out a window and hit some woman a block away reading a newspaper. Right. So we, we are always very cognizant of the structure, the area, and even though we may be out-armed, uh, out, you know, out-armed as far as firepower, we have to use other methods mm -hmm. such as flashbangs, such as dynamic entries, such as the equipment we have to wear. I understand. So we don't get into a big firefight. Right. Ms. Sparks, I'm certainly impressed with uh, the written testimony that you did, as well as the oral testimony. It uh, is apparent that you've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about everything involved. It's apparent that you have a deep feeling for the children that, uh, that you work with, with the Texas Protective Group there. And uh, I admire your, uh, your thoughts on this. And, uh, Certainly appreciate uh, your conclusion at, at the end of it. You back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair yields to Mr. Coble from North Carolina. I, I thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Televised hearings have a way of going far afield. Everyone likes to have his respective mug on television. I guess I'm no exception, so you all bear with us. Mr. Morrison. Yesterday, we heard from a panel 
referring to Mr. Rodriguez, the undercover agent who left the compound, came back to the undercover house with the announcement that the surprise element had been lost. Now this was referred to as the golden egg of intelligence, but the witness continued, it was ignored. It seems to me, conversely, it probably accelerated the decision to raid with that knowledge given to them by Mr. Rodriguez. Have, given this scenario, Mr. Morrison, I, if you will, evaluate the decision to commence with the raid with that background. That background, sir, has to be taken into consideration with the raid plan that existed. That raid plan called for other components that were equally critical to the announcement by the undercover officer. That is, that the other raid components had to be in place if they were going to go proceed, having lost that element of surprise. That possibly would have been a wise decision if the person in charge was aware of all those components. I think that by losing the element of surprise, clearly that was an issue to be considered. But by not having certain prepositioned uh, or rather planned positions in place or without knowing that they were in place to proceed with the raid in a fragmented manner, the command and the, con and the control aspects of that raid were lost. That's, that would be my concern. Uh, so I'm not trying to avoid your question. The element of surprise, I think, was critical. The concern that was expressed by the undercover officer, I, I believe, was critical and needed to be evaluated. It clearly needed to be evaluated in the course of other elements of the plan. And when the communication uh, is isolated so that all elements of the raiding party from the uh, units going in the front door to the person in charge of the whole thing aren't talking to each other or cannot talk to each other, then there's a serious jeopardy or the entry officers. Now, thank you, sir. Mr. Evans, you are a criminal lawyer, defense lawyer for the most part. Uh, oftentimes, people uninformed might casually respond to evidence that might be missing uh, as incidental. Oftentimes, missing evidence, though presumably incidental, can be very significant in the turn of a trial. Of the two matching metal front doors, it is my belief that only one has been recovered, indicating that, as from some, something of the, the legions of paper I've read, that indicate that the shots came from outside the compound. Do you know, strike that, what became of the other door? I do not know, but it's uh, very troubling. It's very troublesome? very troublesome, again, because of the weakness of the excuse about why they couldn't come up with it. Uh, we were told that, that, well, it must have burned up in the fire. The trouble with that is it's a big metal door, and there were other metal doors inside, even in hotter places that didn't burn up. There were cans of food in there that didn't burn up. And a door like that isn't going to totally vaporize. Some remnant of it would be around. Thank you, sir. Mr. Morrison, let me, let me extend my first question. Comment, if you will, about either the presence or the lack of contingency plans that were in place in the event the dynamic entry went sour. I believe that, first of all, that's covered in, in my independent report that's contained in the Treasury report. Uh, I referenced the lack of contingency plan uh, as a manager of of special operations, I would not have approved the plan for without contingency uh, for several reasons. Ones that have been mentioned already, the exposure of that area, uh, the fact that uh, unlike making raids in urban areas, this was a rural area, widely exposed. Uh, there were a number of hazards present that were known and considered by the tactical planners. I think based on the information that they had, 
they did an excellent job of putting together a plan, but there was a lot of information available to ATF that was not passed on to the tactical planners, critical information. Therefore, uh, to go into that type of a dynamic entry in the context of the topography of the location, the types of buildings, the known weaponry, the information that was contained in the search warrant, it was critical to have had <coughs> contingency plans not only for if they lost the element of surprise or if they had to abort the service of the warrant, but also if they ran into something they hadn't expected. For example, if they started taking uh, hostile fire before they ever got to the front door, they had people in conveyances that could not easily move out of that area. What was the ability to cover them and extract them safely at that point? I would have looked for those things in the plan, and that's in my, basically in my report. Thanks, so Mr. Morrison. Our chairman gets anxious when the red light illuminates. I will conclude. I thank you, you all for being here. The gentleman, I uh, thank the gentleman for stating the obvious. Thank you. Move on to Mrs. Laughlin. Laughlin, I'm sorry, in California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Sparks, you um, have, are obviously, uh, care about children and care about um, the children whose welfare you investigated in, in uh, Waco. I'm wondering if, since we don't have a lot of time, uh, whether, did you read the uh, Sinful Messiah story in the Waco newspaper? I, I, we went to Dallas and I didn't have so a chance didn't read to that. really. No. If, if I can summarize a very long story, uh, it, it basically cat catalogs the uh, young, very young girls, uh, 12, 13, who were uh, the wives of David Koresh, and that you referenced also that the, the men had, were celibate and gave their wives to Koresh and the beatings and the like. Were you, had you developed information prior to the raid that would have led you to some of those same beliefs? I'm not saying whether you had a case you could have brought to court, but did you believe that was happening? The same thing that I said before, David never said anything directly, but he would, in scripture, tell you what his belief was. When we interviewed children, uh, they were very cautious. Right. Now, They'll, did you talk to Mr. Aguilera, the, uh, who did a lot of the research work for ATF prior yes. to the raid? Yes, I did. And did he, he had, I've seen his notes, he had a lot of information from talking to ex-cult members along the lines of uh, raping the children, the little girls and the like. Did uh, he share any of that with you, or did you share anything with, with him of that nature, or was it private? Well, he actually had my entire case I file, see. but we shared information. So you both kind of knew the same thing. Yes. I'm wondering whether, one of the things that struck me, and I, I want to know what happened, and I will eventually, I hope, find out, the Laverne police were called in 1989 in California, Laverne, California, to, they were called by uh, the, uh, I think it's the Bund, uh, Robin Bund, who by then was, I think, 19, and uh, apparently Karish had uh, taken her son, and they gave Karish 48 hours to return the little boy, uh, which was done, but uh, when the police returned, uh, Koresh had gone to Texas with a 14-year-old girl, and uh, Robin Bund explained what was happening, that he was uh, raping this little girl. Were you ever notified in Texas that there was this um, rape going on by the California authorities? Or I wonder, I, apparently the FBI was never notified either by Laverne Police. I had no information. Let me ask you, reading through the description of the compound, and I, I'm familiar with California law on child abuse and neglect, not necessarily Texas law, but as I heard the physical description, of that uh, compound with the various hazards, the weapons, the propane tanks, uh, no plumbing so that uh, uh, waste, uh, human waste was in buckets. That would have, in, in my county, those children would have been removed uh, for general neglect if not for abuse. Why, that didn't happen in this case. Why, why wouldn't that happen? in a case like this? Well, in Texas, we're really invested in the family. And the first, the, our first option is to try to work with those uh, families and try to get them to, to make the necessary repairs. But your case was closed, so you weren't working with them for the repairs, correct? Right. 
I, I guess I am very sympathetic to your position, and I've felt this uh, for a long time, that <clears throat> I think people tried to do the best they could with the information they have, but I have a concern that the strict law enforcement raid approach was not, and is approved, did not prove effective in uh, dealing with this particular cult and their psychology. Uh, you said you disagreed with it. Do you think you, you dealt with the agents, uh, you had interface with them, do you think that there was disregard for the welfare of these kids or just uh, a, a misread of the situation? What do you think was going on in terms of the decision making or how the line agents felt, for example? I don't know how the decision was made. I've still tried to get that. But I think they had no malicious intent. I, I think they had no idea that they were going to I think they thought when they all rounded about that those people would just give up. So they, they were pretty shocked to, to see what happened. I was at the command post the night of the raid, and it was like a funeral. It was just really tragic. Thank you. Uh, expired. Um, I yield now to Mr. Blute from Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank all the uh, witnesses uh, for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to focus in on uh, Mr. Morrison, if I could. Uh, I see you're uh, LAPD, and you've had extensive experience uh, in these types of raids. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you were one of the founders of the yes, SWAT uh, team in, in L.A., is that right? Yes, sir, in 1965. Well, my own view is that the intelligence problems in this, uh, in this raid and, and some of the undercover problems led almost inexorably to some type of future problem that was very dangerous to ATF agents. Uh, you, in your report, uh, agreed with, agree with that, and you state that intelligence was compromised from the starting point of the investigation up to and including the hour before the raid. And I think the testimony that this committee has heard uh, for the first few days of this hearing backs that up uh, totally. Uh, time and time again you hear about intelligence problems and problems with the undercover uh, operation. Uh, but I want to ask you particularly what in your judgment how was the intelligence compromised in this case? Well principally the intelligence was compromised by a lack of case management for intelligence. There, the procedure if there was one and, and we did not have uh, during the Treasury investigation, uh, the investigators were looking for all published procedures and policies, and we did not get any, we were not able to develop any clearly existing policy or procedure. That as the background, there was no case management for the, the intelligence function that I could find. Secondly, there were great lapses in the intelligence function in that the information was not reported sequentially, it was not brought to closure, if information, for example, was reported and followed up on, it would turn out to be erroneous. That needed to be noted in the intelligence log so it wouldn't be subsequently passed on for purposes of either obtaining a warrant or expending additional investigative man hours. Uh, secondly, when operations were mounted for intelligence gathering purposes, there was no solid supervision over the agents involved. Let they were allowed to do what they wanted. Pick you up on that. What, what was your opinion of the relative quality of the undercover work, the agents who were uh, pretending to be uh, someone who they weren't, a classic undercover role? Uh, what was your, your opinion of the quality of that work? Well, let me preface it. I'm going to be a pure Monday morning quarterbacker when I say this. Uh, there were two parts of this. One, the, the cover of the college students was bogus and, and was poorly handled. It was a very difficult place to surveil. It was a very difficult place to mount an under undercover operation. I think the second concern, I believe, again, that this is well covered in the Treasury Department investigative report of September 93, is that there was concern that the undercover agents selected to go into the place did not have the experience or the training uh, to handle the type of stresses that were going to be presented uh, to him in that process. Uh, I've done undercover work, I have managed undercover work, and that is one of the things that I'm very sensitive to is the stability and the preparation of an agent or an officer to go into an undercover capacity and to survive 
the, the stresses it's of it. It's a very dangerous uh, thing, normally. It's extremely dangerous for several reasons. First of all, the personal danger to the officer, and secondly, the accuracy of the intelligence the officer can bring out. If the officer's mind gets clouded with stress and fear, we're not going to get accurate reports. You also note in your report that, quote, the absence of management review led to a serious breach of integrity, falsification of documents. I wonder what documents, to your knowledge, were falsified. I believe in part that that was brought out during the course of the investigation. This was information provided uh, to me and to the other technical and tactical experts by the investigative team of Treasury uh, that there, were, there was information known and denied prior to the raid plan. There was information known and uh, apparently either destroyed or falsely articulated after the raid. Uh, we recognized, as, as, as outsiders brought in to assist the Treasury Department, we recognized the, uh, the, the very difficult task facing the Treasury investigators having to wait so long, having such a cooling off period before they could start their investigation. But uh, there, there were large gaps in the stated uh, position of on-duty agent supervisor managers and the facts of the case. I thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, chair yields to Mr. Wise of West Virginia. Chair, yield one minute to Mr. Schumer. I thank the gentleman. I just wanted to follow up on uh, the Justice Department policy of stopping criminal investigations because my colleague from Georgia, Mr. Barr, said that some third party, independent ter third party, told him that Justice Department of Justice policy is not what I said it was. Well, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record Justice Department's statement on law enforcement procedures, and I'd just like to quickly read it. Joanne Harris, the assistant... Object. Is this the Department of Justice news release that they just issued? That is correct. Okay, I'd like the record to reflect this is simply a news release coming out of the Department of Justice in this response is, to this uh, hearing. I would like to carry... My time. That's, uh, that's <laughs> correct. And I would like to say, Mr. Barr can characterize it as he wishes. It is on Department of Justice letterhead. It's a Justice Department statement on law enforcement procedures. Joanne Harris, hardly part of the news department. No, not on my time. State your objection. Well, I don't see the purpose of a press release being inserted in this hearing. How, how does that, Jermaine, if the Justice Department wants to come forward and testify, they can come forward and testify. But can we insert new testimony from any source by simply walking in here saying, by the way, I have a press release uh, that I'd like to put into the record? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I've watched, I believe, press releases be distributed. Uh, we're involved with the Waco situation. We, you inserted as Exhibit 3 uh, Mr. Sparks' um, thoughts, which nobody could even identify as to who put them in. I'd, I'd, when did we suddenly get this high standard? Mr. Chairman, I reserve the right to object and ask. This is ridiculous. I just want to. I just want to yield to the gentleman. This Without objection, so ask a question about it. I, 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 I do not intend to object. As long as it's I, not on my time, I don't mind well, answering anything. I believe any I have a reservation. Thank you. Thank you. And I will yield to the gentleman from New York. And I just wonder I if the it. issue is appropriate uh, policy of the Department of Justice, and was it followed here or not? Do they not have a policy manual or a policy statement rather than a press release that might be admitted to the record? And I yield to the gentleman from New York. Thank you. I would say to the gentleman that this is the Justice Department policy, and I defy anybody to challenge it. I would say, reclaim my time and point out the Justice Department will be here in a few days, and we can dr we get can directly into that. May I, I resume like just reading it? I would like to get to a couple of... As long as it's on his time. Thank you. Yes, Is well, I haven't time? even taken my minute. I just began and I was asked. Well, you have 15 okay. seconds. Okay, well, I'll just Five read. Minutes. The policy says what I said, and the last sentence said, this is prosecution 101, and any prosecutor worth his or her salt should know it. And the entire statement, which I will distribute to every member of the committee and everyone in this room since I'm being not being allowed to finish reading it, even though I didn't get my one minute, says that the Justice Department policy of doing this is routine and was done here in a routine way as it was under Reagan, under Bush, under uh, Clinton. That was the best performance of the whole week. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have, you have, we'll, we'll I thank the gentleman. and give you like uh, two and a half minutes. Mr. Chairman, West Virginia, is that known as a one, uh, a New York minute? Now, uh, 
I have a. I, we'll try to convert that to a West Virginia yeah, thank bond. Thank you, Mr. M Mr. Morrison. I appreciate everything you've said, and 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 as I recall, you were involved in the compilation of this report, were you not? No, sir, not in the compilation of the report. I was involved as a technical and tactical advisor uh, to the Treasury investigative team. I did prepare an independent, totally independent report uh, that is part of that report, but I did not prepare the report. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Have you read this report? Uh, yes, sir, I have. And so, because the point I would like to make is what you're doing is confirming, I believe, every criticism that goes on for 10 pages in here uh, about lack of communication, uh, the loss of the element of surprise, uh, failure to have a contingency plan, all of that is in this report, is it not? Yes, sir, as I've indicated in my testimony yesterday and, and previously today, that, that these are things that I articulated in September, prior to September of 1993. So all of this is already, so what you're doing is confirming, and that's, and I think that's valuable for people to hear that, but there's, no, in terms of learning new uh, criticisms about that raid, it's all in here to begin with. Uh, is sir, that a fair I, statement? Sir, I was brought here under subpoena. My understanding oh, is I'm I understand to answer that. the questions of the yes, sir. members of Congress when they ask me a question, and I'm doing that to the best of my ability. Yes, sir, but it's, it's also important to acknowledge that what you're testifying to has all been covered already uh, in September of 93. I would turn well, and... I'll tell you what, I'll let you have one question. Okay, left. and that was, uh, that's all I wanted. Uh, turning quickly to Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans, uh, as I understand it, you had represented the Davidians uh, pro bono. Do you have any kind of financial interest, book contracts, movie contracts, continue representation of any of the, those associated with the Davidian movement uh, ongoing at this point? Not a one. And I don't represent the Davidians, plural. I represented one man, Norman Allison. He's back in England with his family. And I don't have any... Uh, but you don't have any kind of financial uh, uh, contracts for any kind of books, movies, uh, any, inter any interest, financial interest that might come out? No, of that. Outside no sir. Okay. Thank no, you. No, sir. <clears throat> okay. I yield to Mr. Shabbat from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll yield one minute to my uh, good friend and colleague from Georgia, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Well, curiouser and curiouser, as Alice said. Uh, we have the Department of Justice now, which presumably wasn't paying any attention to what's going on here because nothing new was coming out of it, feeling the need to have the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division find nothing better to do than to waste time sending out a news release for spin control. Isn't it interesting, if nothing new were coming out of these hearings, why would they need to do this? Even more curious than that, I would say to my colleagues on the other aisle, is the fact that we had an Assistant United States Attorney with this Department of Justice who is in charge of these cases, who sat at this table two days ago, looked at these same documents, and presumably he's been to Prosecution 101 as well, and he said this is not standard operating procedure. He's never seen anything like it. So I suspect that, uh, that the Department of Justice may want to send him to their new Prosecution 101. Mr. Evans, again, for the record, have you, in your years of experience handling criminal cases in federal court, seen documents like these? And I would also note for the record that if this were standard operating procedure, the ATF would be stopped in every single case in which they conduct a shooting review if this document reflected official, consistent Department of Justice policy. Mr. Evans. I must hope that whoever wrote that press release has not actually scrutinized these documents to see what they Suspect really they say. Have because if they see the words on here, they would know that a statement like that says that they could violate the Constitution of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Evans, and I appreciate my colleague from Ohio. Uh, Ms. Sparks, I just had a couple questions for you, and I wanted to thank you uh, for your testimony thus far here today and for the care that, that you took in this matter, particularly with respect to the children uh, in Waco. Um, you had uh, prepared a statement that we received uh, and in the statement, you said that there were many dynamics that contributed to the end result at Mount Carmel, uh, including in some cases attitudes of individuals who felt that they were accountable to no one. Um, who are the individuals that you were talking about there, and what did you mean by your statement uh, that they felt that they were accountable to no one? Well, when I wrote that, 
all through all the agencies, state and federal, there were people who didn't think they needed to listen. They thought they had all the answers. They had a task to do and they were going to do it. And they, you know, you couldn't get them to even stop and listen to information that could have been very vital. And uh, they just thought they were above it. And you had the opportunity to go out to the compound a number of times. I think you mentioned at least three times or so. That's correct. Um, when you went out there, did you ever see any evidence or hear anybody talk about uh, a, uh, any sort of drugs or in particular a methamphetamine drug lab of any sort? Yes, we talked about that with uh, at least two different people. David Koresh explained to me that the previous prophet had been involved in drugs, had a, had a drug lab there, uh, and said that he had given that material, the needles and the drug, uh, a book explaining how to make drugs. He'd given that all to the sheriff's department in McLennan County. Okay, so you're saying it was gone already then? That was, yes. That was what you knew? Okay. Um, now, relative to you, you had met with the children a number of times. How, how old were the kids that were there? What were the youngest? I think the youngest was about three months old, as I recall. The oldest one, uh, we didn't get to see all of the teenage girls. There was one 17-year-old girl who was there. Okay. And I think you had stated that was really your principal concern, was the children that were in the facility? Yes, sir. Um, and, and I just want to say, because my time's just about up here, I didn't get to get into too many of the, the questions that I wanted to get into, maybe can later, but I, uh, uh, I have tremendous uh, sympathy for the, the law enforcement agencies and their families uh, that were killed here. Uh, I have tremendous sympathy uh, for the children uh, as well that were in this facility. They were completely innocent in this whole matter. Um, the the gun-toting uh, minions of, of David Koresh, uh, those folks, I have no sympathy at all for the adults that were responsible for this, but the law enforcement officers and the children in particular were completely innocent in this matter. The time has expired. Uh, Chair recognizes Mrs. Slaughter from New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Ms. Parks, I'm very impressed as well with uh, your hard work and the fact that despite the fact that you law enforcement was working against you, you went on to do your job. Uh, every trip that you made out there, it was carefully controlled, isn't that correct? You only saw what David Koresh would allow you to see. We always felt like we weren't getting the full picture, that things were being kept from us, and that was verified during some of the interactions. At that point, you did not understand that every young girl knew that sometime in her life she would be raped by David Koresh. I knew the allegation was that, but we didn't get that specific information in our initial investigation. And he did not talk to you about guns? David Koresh was very open about the guns. That he had the guns there? Yes, he was very open about that. If, uh, I understand that, and I wish that the law enforcement people had listened to you a bit more, uh, and perhaps we know more than we do used to then, but the federal uh, officer's real job was to serve those warrants and look for uh, guns and not really to understand his religion, which should have been irrelevant here. But given uh, your knowledge of David Koresh and his followers, are, do I understand that you believe there was some way that someone could have reached him so that he would have submitted to a warrant and arrest? My point is that if they had separated him from his followers to execute those things simultaneously perhaps, but, but to get them apart, the prophecy could have never been fulfilled because the prophecy was that he had to die with the saints. So they wouldn't have acted on that. He had been arrested before. But you think that people back in the compound then would have, given the fact that they had been so indoctrinated, uh, your prophet or a second prophet or whatever was coming up? No, David was the only lamb, and they would not have acted because they had to die with him. That was the prophecy. Mm -hmm. Knowing what we know now, had he given himself up for arrest, he would certainly have been charged with rape, uh, child abuse, perhaps incest, as I understand it. No other men in the compound had sex, so the small babies you saw must have been his own. 
Would you sur surmise that? Yes. How many children do you think he fathered in that compound? Two years ago, I could have told you. I haven't looked at those records in a long time. There were a lot of young children that belonged to him. Knowing this kind of sort of cultish belief in that people are able to suspend their own thoughts and follow slavishly someone into death and that even allow their wives to be taken away from them. First, you think that he would have ever submitted himself outside. Is it possible one of the reasons he was so rarely seen was that arrested having been charged with the crimes that I have mentioned, that he would have faced the rest of his life in prison? Well, remember, he thought he was the lamb. And so he, uh, he always assumed he could talk his way out of anything. Mm -hmm. And you believe that his followers, once he was gone, would have suddenly wakened like Sleeping Beauty with the kiss of the prince or something and would have said, Lo, we've been under this wicked spell and now we're going to let the ATF people come in peacefully? I think that they, wouldn't have, they would have just waited for word from David about what to do. And what word do you think David would have sent them? I have no idea. Wouldn't it be pretty likely that he would want them to go on and fulfill his prophecy? I don't you see, I, my, the reason I'm asking you that, it, was, it seemed to me that the fewer people there were to testify against David Koresh and what had been happening in that compound and the fewer little girls like Carrie who could come out and tell us what their life was like, the better off he would have been facing court charges that he would have faced. Um, so, would you, do you think that he would have ever given himself up? He had been arrested in the, in the past, and I believe that if they if they that served was in 1989. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. When he had the shootout with Mr. Roden, right? Uh, he couldn't have pronounced himself the Lamb and the Prophet at that point because the Lamb and the Prophet at that point was Mr. Roden, correct? Not to David Koresh. But he uh, the fact is that he wanted to become the Lamb and the Prophet. But in his mind, he already was the Lamb. Well, I, I see that my time is up, but I, it would seem to me that he would do anything in this world and everybody else in there with him to keep from being arrested or taken, including setting fire to that compound and burning those people to death. You are absolutely correct. Your time is up. Uh, Chair, now I recognize Mr. Schiff from New Mexico. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think before I begin questions, I think it's appropriate to emphasize what ought to be the focal points uh, shown thus far today. First, it was argued that this hearing has been tainted by staff contacts with the National Rifle Association. I have to say that if any cabinet member called up a member of this committee and tried to influence questions, if that occurred, that'd be a far greater taint than anything that could be done on the staff level. There's been a lot of discussion of misrepresentation, and if a consultant called Ms. Sparks, and misrepresented who she was and who, who she was with, that's not defensible. But that consultant doesn't work for the U.S. Congress. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms does. And the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms misrepresented to the United States military the nature of this raid. Although they knew it was a firearms raid, they called it a drug raid to take down a methamphetamine lab because that was the only way that they could get the training they wanted from the particular army unit that they contacted because that army unit had only a drug, anti-drug mission. And finally, we've heard a great deal about concern for children and certainly uh, uh, Mr. Koresh acted despicably towards the children who lived with him in that compound. But I wonder how much concern for children our government showed when, for example, when the number two person at the Department of Treasury, Roger Altman, for whom the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearm work, uh, advises his boss, Secretary Benson, on April 15, 1993, that he believes the FBI is going to take more drastic action to end the siege. And he states, Mr. Altman, the risks of a tragedy are there. And Secretary Benson's response was basically, that's not our department's problem anymore. That was the governmental version of saying, that's not my table. Now, it is true that the Department of Justice and, and Attorney General Reno were in charge at that time. But that didn't prevent Secretary Benson from forwarding this memo from Mr. Altman to the Justice Department so that the Attorney General had the benefit of these views. And, and that brings me to the questions I'd like to ask. Ms. Sparks, 
Uh, let me say, uh, I was a criminal prosecutor before I, I got to Congress, and I've prosecuted child abuse cases, and I know the difficulty of putting together evidence in the cases you worked on. Um, but I'd like to ask your view of this situation. You said that the raid, and these are your words, the raid on the Branch Davidian compound was a fatal mistake. And you went on to explain that you knew that there'd be armed resistance and you didn't think the ATF command really believed that would be the case. I'd like to take it a step further, though. And, I, and I'm address you worked with law enforcement frequently in your position, I, is that right? Yes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you as, as, a prof as, as another law enforcement professional. Um, the, the ATF did have an arrest warrant for Mr. Koresh and a search warrant. Or suppose that you, you had been able to get enough evidence to charge Mr. Koresh with child abuse, which I understand was difficult to do. But suppose that the Texas authorities had been able to get an arrest warrant for Mr. Koresh or a search warrant. How, how what would have been the best way to uh, enforce those warrants? Because certainly the law enforcement agencies do have an obligation to take action if they have a valid warrant. What, in other words, what would you have done? Well, we were already involved, which was one of the points I was trying to make when our cl case was closed. We had an opportunity to get to know the children better. Um, I think that relationship would have been helpful. We often ha have law enforcement assist when we're interviewing perpetrators, and they are brought in, or we meet with them. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, my time is about to, to run out here. In this particular situation, if, if, with the arrest warrant that ATF had, let's leave it that way, what would you have done to enforce the arrest and search warrant? How would you have gone, gone about the situation different from the raid you call a fatal mistake? I don't have all the information they had, but for me, I would have, I would have served the arrest warrant on David outside the group and then maybe simultaneously did the search warrant. I, I'm not knowledgeable in those things, but this was just predictable. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think my, my time has expired. Thank you. It has, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor from Mississippi for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I do want to thank the panel for sticking around. I'll begin with you, Ms. Sparks. Ms. Sparks, in retrospect, especially after what the young lady, Carrie Jewell, said the other day, did the Texas Child Protective Agency do their job? Did they protect those children from David Koresh? My agency and I were in controversy about that. Isn't it safe to say that they failed? Whether their intentions were good or not, they failed. Mistakes they were definitely made. So the law really didn't give you everything you needed to do your job, did it? That was the most frustrating part. So we contrary to all these people talking about a government out of control, you didn't even have the vehicle through the law to do your job to protect those kids, did you? That's right. And I want that for the record. Because people keep talking about a government out of control, and here's a woman who suspected something was wrong, and yet the laws of this country protected the criminal. Protected the criminal more than those little kids and didn't let you do your job. Also want to go on, I have asked Treasury for some information. This is some testimony that they have supplied. And it says that Ms. Sparks stated during her conversations with Koresh that he described himself to her as the messenger from God and that when he reveals himself, the Los Angeles, California riots will pale in comparison to what was going to happen in Waco, Texas. Ms. Park stated that when she asked him to elaborate, all he would say was that the world was coming to an end, and when it happens, it will be a military-style operation, and that all non-believers would have to suffer. Is it safe to say the non-believers are the people who aren't a member of that cult? Everybody who is a non-believer, he considered Babylon, and those Okay. So that's everyone right. other than his cult was going to suffer? That's right. That's right. Did you consider him a dangerous person in your heart? Yes. Were you ever afraid when you were around him? In your heart? I never put myself in a position that I felt I was in real danger, but he was threatening, yes. He was a threatening person? Yes. Okay. Mr. Evans, I have a question for you. Now, I, I missed all of your testimony, but I take it you are a criminal defense attorney. That's how you make your living? Yes, sir. I'm proud you good of it. at it? I'm good at it, and I'm proud of it. Have most of the people you've defended gotten off? Of course not, because most people, are, about 90% of the people who go to trial are convicted. I, I see. I'm talking about in your instances. Mine, I'm no exception. So some of the people you defended got convicted of breaking the law? Absolutely. Okay. 
And they should with, be. And, and, and with that in mind, sir, if you ever went into a trial and only the prosecution could subpoena witnesses, how would you feel and what would you do? Well, I'm, I suffer from that imbalance all the time. Is it legal? Congressman. Is it legal? It, I'll put it like this. The prosecution has much, much more subpoena power than we ever do, even though we do have the right to subpoena, but we don't have the resources to do would it. Would you so challenge would... that trial if you were prohibited by the courts from subpoenaing people who could speak on behalf of your clients? Well, I wouldn't. It just it depends. Well, I'm, I'm asking. If I was absolutely prohibited, then, of course, I would challenge it. And then the question would go, well, was the subpoena you wanted material or not? I can't just subpoena okay, well, anybody well, let's, let's or anything. Okay, let's take a step further. You have a client. He's got people that can prove his case overwhelmingly. He's got people who can say, my God, this never should have happened. I shouldn't even be going to trial. Yeah. And you were prohibited by the court from letting those people speak before the court. What would you do? I would have to prove that first. But if I could show some, some judge that that person was, in fact, material, and did have the kind of evidence you described, I can't imagine a judge not issuing a subpoena. And I believe it would be unconstitutional okay. so it, not is, to. Is, you're obviously a decent person, a good man. As a decent person, a good man, and someone who makes his living defending people, don't you think it would be fair to those four dead ATF agents and the 20 who were wounded that the people who want to speak on behalf of them and the testimony that we'd like to have on behalf of them be submitted to the people of America in this room? We're I talking in a sense would, of fairness, I because think, you just said that you expect fairness. I think those people deserve fairness. I think all the people that died in this outrage uh, should have the benefit of complete, full, and fair hearings on the material issues of this case, but not all of these rabbit trails and side issues that I've seen banner banned by both sides. Yes, sir, but, by both sides. Okay, but is someone who claims to have been held by Koresh for three months a rabbit trail or side issue? Is someone who claims he had a hit list of people who's going to have eliminated a side trail? Are the two reporters who published his series and then left town for fear for their lives a side trail? I'm gonna, wait, they sir. may not be. Hey, I might agree okay. with you. I just don't know. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I did make a promise to everybody, and I'm going to keep it, that every single panel, whether favorable or unfavorable, was going to be asked the same question. Has anything that any of you have seen or read or heard justify the murder of those four ATF agents and the wounding of the 20 more by David Koresh and his followers on the morning of February 28th? Please, we'll start with you, Ms. Parks, ladies first. Nothing can justify that. Thank you, Ms. Parks. Mr. Morrison? Previously asked and answered, sir. This, the answer yesterday was? I, I answered the question yesterday, sir. Same and question. And you answered? No, there was no justification. Thank you, sir. Mr. Evans? There can be a legal justification. Judge Smith, in the trial, gave it to the jury, and I'll read it for you as, as follows. Now, bear in mind that the, that the jury has to decide if these are the facts I'm or not. I'm asking your opinion, not the judge's. Right. My opinion is, is that there could be a legal... Uh, uh, a, de a legal definition and a legal defense. If a defendant is not an aggressor and has reasonable grounds to believe that he is in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm for which he could save himself only by using deadly force against his assailants, he had the right to employ deadly force in order to defend himself. In my mind, given these situations, I wouldn't feel that way. I wouldn't feel that I would have the right to do that. But I can't get inside the minds of these people who don't but think I'm, I'm asking mind. you from what the you've seen and heard. No, sir, these two people are still answering the question. That is the procedure we've had all day. Well, he, I thought he was finished. These, these two gentlemen. Absolutely not, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to finally say something. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I wish I had more time, sir. Sir, on behalf of the 10,000 members, federal agents that I represent, it's reprehensible for anyone to even to think that those people had any right or any defense, sir, to kill those agents. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. I thank the panel. Chair recognizes Mr. Satter. I'd just like to note for the record that the witnesses that Mr. Taylor have been calling is, uh, or talks about calling, I understood yesterday that the agents who were in charge are suing them because they believe that their premature release of an article led to the death of their fellow, fellow agents. 
So uh, while I understand the need for some background information, uh, they did not exactly uh, uphold what we needed to be done at that time either to protect the lives of the children uh, in particular who were clearly uh, uh, kind of forgotten in this whole incident. Uh, that I uh, felt as um, uh, I've heard a number of things here. One is, is that uh, I was very touched the other day when Carrie Jewell was talking and uh, she'd clearly been through this a number of times before, but when she heard a number of other people talk about the fire and the deaths, tears came to her eyes as she heard about the other children dying. And uh, it brought back memories of those children and those deaths. And Ms. Sparks, you said that you felt that the agents um, didn't think they needed to listen, that they thought that they, they were uh, above it. I don't think anybody's questioning the dangers anymore to a lot of the law enforcement officials. I have many, many friends in these different agencies from having lived in Northern Virginia in a neighborhood where many were people in law enforcement. But there's a, a feeling and a concern that uh, it's getting a little bit, uh, how should I say, the showtime question, a little bit over aggressive and not sensitive enough, particularly when there were children involved in this instance. I wanted to ask um, a question regarding to, to Mr. Evans and uh, regarding a comment that Mr. Oboisky made, uh, which I believe he did not mean to go as wide, but it was a scary comment. He said, the day is over when two people in a suit can issue a warrant. What's your reaction to that statement, Mr. Evans? I would, wanted to ask first. I hope he really didn't mean that because it's frightening if taken literally that every time any peace officer in this country executes any warrant, and I wrote it down, he said execute a warrant of any kind without this kind of military garb, uh, you know, that's, we will be a, a military government rather than a civilian government if we let that continue. Because there is really uh, no question, I don't believe in any of our minds, that when there are signs of imminent danger whether it be a drug case or an arms case, that it's a little bit different. But we're worried about the mentality that seems to be moving through this country. And as we uh, have a breakdown of some of our standards of morality, we need the law enforcement to realize there are agents to try to keep calm in these situations. One concern I have, and if Mr. Evans could uh, exhibit, we had earlier distributed a copy of a picture uh, of, uh, we don't know whether it's an FBI or an ATF agent. Um, on top of a tank with American flag and two guns after, it was clearly after the first and before the second event. There are a number of pictures that have been shown in the news um, uh, and they're also available and I would ask that they be inserted in the record and, and distributed where uh, agents were standing uh, in front uh, of the building burning in the back uh, and others, but this type of picture doesn't mean that there was any malicious intent by any agents, that there was any uh, a desire to do that, but it, when people are, particularly little children, are dying in the background, or that you're trying to prepare for something that could lead to the death of children, this comes very close to showboating. And uh, I am very disappointed because I understand that people were, tr were trying to do the best they could to uphold the laws, and I'm concerned about a mentality in this country uh, not that it's pervasive and not that it's there, but we need our law enforcement officials to help calm down the situation, just like we need all these madmen with their guns or threatening their communities around them to disarm and not be so aggressive any time somebody does come to the door, or we will wind up in a situation where we have tanks and armored vehicles coming in. And I just wanted to put that into the record and express my concern that all law enforcement officials, if nothing else coming out of this hearing, say, be careful, don't repeat some of the errors that were made in this and, uh, and yet not take our sides questioning as condemning all law enforcement officials who every day our lives are on the line risking it trying to uphold our laws. Thank the chairman. Be a back to balance whatever. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. The chair now yields to Mr. Shattuck. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Evans. I'd like to start with you and focus on one issue that's now become somewhat central. Um, there's a memo that you have a copy of from uh, Ronald K. Noble. I guess it's from Sarah Jones to Ronald K. Noble, dated September 17, 1993. I believe you've had a blow up made of it. It goes into this issue of the Department of Justice ordering 
uh, the ATF to stop its shooting review. Are you familiar with the memo I'm referring to? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, we have just had interjected into this hearing uh, by Mr. Schumer a press release put out by the Department of Justice uh, which purports to state the Department of Justice's policy on this issue. Do you have a copy of that? Yes, I do. Have you had a chance to read that press release? Yes, I have. Okay. It says in the first paragraph uh, that it is not at all unusual for the Department of Justice to request an agency to temporarily hold off from interviewing potential witnesses uh, in the Justice Department's criminal investigation uh, that, that would be normal to do that. And then in the second paragraph, it talks about the reason for that. I want to go back and ask you, is there anything in the September 17 memo which suggests that when uh, they advised Hartnett to stop the ATF shooting review, that that was a temporary, they were making a request that they temporarily halt it? Absolutely not. And to the contrary, it, it says that that's not the reason that they're uh, suspending the interviews. It has nothing to do with temporarily uh, holding off so that the criminal investigation can proceed and they don't want too many cooks in the kitchen or fingers in the pie. The stated reason for not interviewing anybody else and reducing their comments to writing in this document is immediately they, that the review team immediately determined that these stories did not add up and that <clears throat> Johnston advised Hartnett to stop the shooting review, not for some Prosecution 101 reason, but because the ATF was creating Brady material. You have to understand that Brady means indicates innocence. I understand exactly what you're saying. I want the listening audience to understand what's going on here. First of all, you were reading from the memo. In this memo, it says they determined that the stories didn't add up. They had two conflicting agents. They interviewed two agents. One said that one agent had shot. The other said they'd taken that agent's gun and there'd been no shots fired from it. What they had was interviews that were producing uh, evidence which was flat contradictory. And they go on to say, stop the ATF shooting review because it is creating Brady material. Brady material is material which tends to go to prove the innocence of the defendant. Isn't that right? Yes, and David Crash wasn't on trial. We now had this, 11 other souls on trial. Now, this Department of Justice press release that Mr. Schumer put into evidence or wanted to put into evidence specifically says that it's their normal policy to ask people to temporarily hold off. This was not a temporary hold off, was it? No. It was permanent. So in, that, in that sense, it was permanent. Well, the shooting review, it's my understanding that later on, months later, the shooting review team did come back through and that the, at the Texas Rangers did come and interview those people, but uh, it's apples and oranges. Well, if in fact, the, the second paragraph of this press release says it's common to ask that simultaneous interviews not go forward so that you won't have confusion. But this wasn't an it. The issue of simultaneous interviews wasn't what was going on here, was it? Not at all. The memo itself details what was going wrong, and that was they had two different agents describing the same event and saying different things about it. That's true, and that is reiterated. That's not just an accidental mistake. That's reiterated throughout those documents. The word exculpatory is used twice. This asking questions to which would require us to create new documents exculpatory. It's Let clear me make one what more they point. were doing. Let me make one more point. If this memo were to say we can't ever conduct a shooting review while there's an ongoing criminal investigation, which is where the shooting occurred by the agent, they would never conduct a shooting review because there's always the ongoing underlying case, and indeed there's the case which leads to trial and then to appeal and then to appeal and then to appeal and then to appeal. And so if you could never do a shooting case while the underlying criminal shooting review, while the underlying criminal investigation was going on or the criminal prosecution was going on, you could never do a shooting review, could you? You know what I think that the, the department spin on this now is? It's like a lot of prosecutors have said about my clients in, in closing argument when they have incriminating documents like this and my client's given some explanation. They get up and say, what he's trying to do to you is say to you, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? Now, I'm telling you, <laughs> who are you going to believe? Some press release 
are the words that were written back then contemporaneously in 1993 before anybody had a chance to think about ever having these kind of hearings. Well, I would suggest that whoever wrote this press release either hadn't listened to the testimony at this hearing or read the document that you were testing about, testifying about, or they are intentionally trying to draw the attention off of what this, uh, this document shows. And it looks to me like an attempt to confuse or an attempt to continue a cover-up. I don't know. My time's expired. I, I, ho I hope not. <clears throat> Okay, the chair recognizes Mr. McCollum for seven and a half minutes. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morris and I, uh, I want to ask you one quick question here. This is a book that you probably know Mr. Rivas, who testified earlier, wrote. In the book, he tells a story about, or at least tells about, a fellow named Lynch, who was a deputy sheriff, I believe, at the time, who went the morning of the raid to a command post for communications, as I recall. And it was at that post that he received during the early part of this raid a frantic 911 call from Wayne Martin, who was a Davidian attorney in, inside that compound, did a lot of the talking that day, that led to the ultimate uh, ceasefire and so forth that morning. Uh, but he also tells the fact that, that Lynch could not, after he got Martin on the phone, for minutes, several minutes, 20 minutes or something, find uh, any way to communicate with any of the raid party or anybody involved with the raid he, because they didn't have any telephones, any portable phones or any way he had, he didn't have anything with him, I presume a radio or anything, to communicate with him. Are you familiar with that and to what extent does that fit into what you've been telling us about, about the lack of communication or communication plan? That's a several part question. First of all, I'm not familiar with the book or, or the text that's in that book. I'm not familiar with the incident as related, sir. Uh, I did refer to my concern of the l lack of appropriate communications with all the principals involved in this raid party, particularly the prompt relaying of information uh, to the actual tactical team that was making the approach. Uh, and so that's about all I can say to that. But you'd say that, that in light I'm, of what you know about the lack of communications, that would not be surprising if it were true. I, I believe that the lack of communications uh, was an issue. It was well developed within the investigation. And if the information that is in that book uh, is accurate, it would probably be consistent with the concerns about the lack of communications previously established. Thank you. Mr. Evans. Uh, in part of your testimony today, you, you gave us a lot of written testimony. We haven't had much chance to go over some of that. One of the titles you've got here is called of subparagraph Showtime. And you say trial testimony revealed that the code word to launch the raid was Showtime. Can you tell us what that meant and what, what that was all about? Well, that's absolutely true. The agent swore under oath and testified that that was the code word to kick this raid off. It was, okay, it's Showtime. And the next thing they said was, Goggles down, weapons out, fingers off the trigger. Of course, there's some evidence we won't have time to go into that maybe one of those guns went off and shot that second pickup truck. But that was their instruction. And then after that, you say in your testimony, two separate public relations agents, Sharon Wheeler from Dallas, who's going to be one of our witnesses, and Francesca Perot of Houston, were assigned to the operation. Pre-raid video from the command headquarters shows a prepared public relations center with fax machines, telephones, and computers. Is that your testimony? That's my testimony, and I've got the videotape with me. Well, it just seems interesting to me that if what Mr. Revis uh, had in mind when he wrote in his book, and that if it is true, and it appears that it is, he was here testifying the other day, that they didn't even have uh, telephones or communications to get that 911 communication back and forth that Wayne Martin had from inside the compound for 20 minutes trying to stop the shooting. Uh, but at the same time, they had fax machines, telephones, and computers, and were ready for whatever PR they had that that was a mighty, mighty strange operation to say the least, and certainly a fatal flaw, not to pun a word. Let me ask you about something else that uh, Mr. Bryant asked earlier of you, and he didn't quite get a chance to finish up. No-knock warrant. Yes, when you have a no-knock warrant, shouldn't that have been served by going to the door? And if you, if you had a, I mean, if you didn't have a no-knock warrant, in this case, you did not have a no-knock warrant, right? They did not have a no-knock warrant. Let's let you explain the difference, because that's been a long time since we've been over that. What's the difference between a no-knock warrant and some other kind of warrant? 
Well, theoretically, it's supposed to mean that the officers, if they don't have specific authority to just kick the door down without announcing themselves, that they're supposed to knock on the door and announce themselves as police officers and go on in. I will tell you, I've been doing this a long time, and for five or six years, I rode with the police. I have never seen a police agency that didn't scream police on the way to the porch and kick the door before the words echoed off the front door. You know, they don't knock and announce. It just doesn't happen. Now, there's a lot of uh, of uh, exceptions to that where the police can say well even though we didn't have a no-knock warrant this and that happened and so therefore we had to go ahead and crash in and the status of the law now is that there's so exceptions so many exceptions and all the not all many many restraints have been taken off of police officers and quite frankly we're frustrated and that's why I'm here because there's little we can do about it but isn't it true that uh, at least uh, theoretically under the law if you had a warrant that wasn't a no-knock warrant like the one in this case, and this was not a no-knock warrant, this was a regular old warrant, that uh, the officer who had that on his possession should have been up there at the front lines at least kicking the door in or helping kick it in, at the very least not back in the truck or vehicle where under the testimony we had yesterday, he, he testified, Mr. Sarabin, that it was shot full of holes he presumed and destroyed uh, on the seat of a vehicle. Uh, he never quite got it out of the vehicle before that happened. By the way, a Agent Ballesteros admitted in the under oath at the trial that they never even practiced a no-knock peaceable entry down at Fort Hood. And the, the team that went up to the rooftop that we see in the television, where tragically those people were killed, uh, they said they couldn't have known what was happening at the front door. They were under orders to go through that window regardless. Well, I think that's an obvious uh, thing from looking at the films. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to jump you ahead of where we are because you're not going to be back with us. The fire, the ultimate end of this whole tragedy uh, in April. Uh, you have uh, given us testimony talking about the question of not of where, just where the fire started, but the knowledge uh, of those who were involved earlier in the morning of the fire about the likelihood that the Davidians would start a fire. And that comes from the tapes and the transcripts and the studies that you've done of all this as part of the work you've done in trial and the observations you've made. Could you describe that for us? Why, I think you said uh, that they should have known this, basically, and, and instead of backing off, they pushed ahead. They should have known that morning that a fire was going to happen. Could you tell us about why you've analyzed it, what you've come Mr. to Mr. Chairman, it's not that they should have known. They knew. And let me tell you how I can make such a definitive statement. Those tapes show that at 6.05 in the morning, six hours before this fire ever broke out. The audio were, tapes. The audio tapes. I'm sorry, the audio tapes of the electronic bugging that the FBI is monitoring with earphones to see what's going on in there say that words like, let's spread the fuel, give more fuel, spread it around here. That went on for about 20 minutes. And then sporadically throughout the morning as the tanks pounded the place, more mention was, was of, of fire and spreading fuel. It's, it's throughout that. Now, I know what the FBI says about it because I saw... Uh, Special Agent Jeffrey Jamar on a national TV show two weeks ago say, well, we had to enhance those tapes in order to hear them because we, and we really didn't know that morning. Uh, uh, let, uh, would you let him please finish and we can clarify. Okay. I was in this room when Ray Yon testified under oath to you folks two days ago and, I, and he was trying to show you that the Davidians started the fire. And he tried to show the jury in San Antonio that the Davidians started the fire the same way. And he testified very truthfully that he could hear those tapes unenhanced with his ears the first time he listened to them. Your record will show he told you that. And it's true because I was in the courtroom in San Antonio when the tapes were played unenhanced. And the record shows that. And I've got the transcripts from the record with me. Somebody wants to look at it that you could hear that conversation unenhanced. Now, true, it was garbled. True, you had to listen carefully. And yes, you could, every now and then, you couldn't distinguish words and you could argue about it. But if you take the sum total of it, the whole morning for six hours and listen to all of it, you had to have known that somebody in there was going to start that fire. So we miss the issue. We run down a rabbit trail if we try to decide who started the fire or who didn't start the fire. Let's just say the Davidians did start the fire. Our government's held to a higher standard than those people in that compound. And they knew for six hours that continuing to pound that place and tear down the whole backside of it 
was going to cause something like this. But folks, they have been down there too long. It was going to be over. Listen to their PA announcements. David, it's over. Come out. And it was going to be over. Come hell, high water, or holocaust. And what we got was a holocaust. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Point of, point of clarification. He did not make it clear. He said he knew for certain that someone was saying it was spreading fuel. Yes, who? The Davidians, the FBI, the Army? Or the Davidians. Well, the Davidians were spreading fuel amongst themselves. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I just want this clear for the record, Mr. Evans. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I ask unanimous consent uh, that uh, the documents that Mr. Evans is referring to be introduced uh, uh, into the record along with his testimony. Without objection, so ordered. And my written... Chairman, that's the quickest, uh, reserving the right to object. I mean, What's your objection? I, I'm just asking what the documents are. I may not object. At this okay, point. if Mr. Evans could identify them again. You were just referring, I think, to some transcripts. I prepared a written statement, and it has exhibits attached to it. I would like for that to be introduced since my, I don't have much time. But the thing that, that you're referring to is the, the trial transcripts about the testimony concerning those tapes. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get them. I have them in my briefcase down here. All, all, uh, all statements from the witnesses, uh, any of you have any material that you want to supply, we'll be happy to admit in the weather. And record. additionally, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask unanimous consent, I don't think I've uh, done this yet. The, the documents that, that, uh, that I've uh, introduced uh, two days ago certainly will be in. The uh, ones that are blown up here, I would ask uh, for those to be uh, uh, entered into the record. Uh, as well as the two Merit System Protection Board uh, settlement agreements that we've referred to. I don't think I move specifically to have those uh, placed in the record, too. State your uh, objection. The gentleman means copies of the, of the posters, not the posters themselves. Uh, it would be a mighty big book, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, if we could Good point. And, and I, actually, Mr. Chairman, I had a reservation, too. I don't suppose the gentleman would like to ask Mr. Evans to put in the rest of uh, his file on this case, would you? <laughs> But you got it. If I, may, I, may I ask a question of clarification, too, on your reservation? Would you yield on your Certainly. reservation? Uh, am I correct that what Mr. Evans and Mr. Barr wanted put into the record beyond Mr. Evans' statement were copies of the transcript of the trial proceedings he was involved with that were relevant that he referred to in his testimony? He ha has those in his briefcase. Is that, is that not what you're referring to, Mr. Evans? I'm referring to excerpts from the trial transcript. I'm sure you have somewhere. It would just be easier for me to put it in and point it out to you. That, I think that's what he wanted to do. That's what they're referring to. I'm just wondering at this point whether we just ought to get a copy of the trial transcript and introduce the whole thing, not just the salient parts that Mr. Evans uh, has with him. I think, well, I think I understand we probably already have it. But without objection, so ordered. Without, I remove my reservation. Withdraw your Sorry. objection. Certainly. Without also, objection, um, so Mr. ordered. Mr. Chairman, can I clarify uh, when uh, Mr. Schumer moved to have the... Uh, uh, Department of Justice news release uh, entered in that it was entered in at that time. Is that that's correct? Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, you didn't, we didn't put the whole trial transcripts in from the trial. Is that going to be in our records? The excerpt is what I heard. Mr. So far, it's the excerpts. Okay. How big a briefcase yeah, do you that. have? Okay, I just wanted to <laughs> clarify what happened in that. Occasion. He just has a small briefcase. Yeah, there were just some, some notes there. Oh, okay. Uh, you all right? Okay. Um, I've got seven and a half minutes. And uh, Mr. Evans, uh, can you, uh, I think we reviewed these documents over here to your uh, left. Having reviewed them, uh, how would you characterize the actions of the Justice Department? If you look at the face of these documents and the words that are written on there, to me, it points squarely to an obstruction of justice. It does. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, do you feel you've been here just for a few hours? We've been here, seems like, for many, many days, but uh, this is our third day. Uh, there are some who have said that uh, nothing new uh, has come out of these uh, hearings. Have you heard anything new today? Absolutely, I've heard something new today. I heard it first. To two days ago when uh, Congressman Barr uh, brought it forward. But, but it's more than that. Well, at the end of three days, how would you just quickly, in a minute, characterize some of the things that you consider to be important that have come out of these hearings? 
the main lesson is that we got to learn that there, even though the vast majority of law enforcement is honest and dedicated, they're got, they take their ranks from the same pool of humanity the rest of us are from, and there's going to be a percentage in there that will be willing to lie and distort the truth, either to get what they want, like helicopters, or to cover their backside when they're criticized, like others. And this case is permeated through and through with you, it. Do you, have you read the uh, Treasury Department report? Uh, a year ago. <laughs> and, and I, either yeah, yes I, or no. Well, yes. You have. And do you feel that that, I mean, we've heard 70% agreements and 72%. Uh, where would you weigh in? Do you think that that uh, pretty much as it's written uh, tells the story in a very correct way? Here's the problem with it. And, and I don't know about the good faith of the folks who said that it's reliable and thorough and all that. But the problem with it is this. That house is built on a foundation of shifting sand. Because to believe that treasury report, you have to believe the reports of the agents who were giving you the information. And from day one, their stories didn't add up. And then... You are, you, the are, you saying, are you saying that there were agents of either the FBI or ATF that either changed, forged, um, or rewrote documents or misled their... You see, I don't know I'm what trying to figure is. out what you're saying. I don't know what this is, refers to. I'm just saying that there's a track record. There's a history throughout this case of different agents and different agencies, they, the, even the FBI, who would make misrepresentations for their own personal benefit. And there's got to be a way to safeguard against that. It, the meth lab is one. The, this false affidavit in the second shooting in order to get Norman Allison in jail for a year. Uh, I could go on because I made a list. Well, let me ask you, what do you know about the gas, the CS gas, and, and, and the decision that was made to use it? I, nothing. I'm, I'm not the person to ask about that. You're not the person to ask that? No, sir. Um, do you feel that, uh, and I'll go to Mrs. Sparks in a second, do you feel that this, this whole investigation has been covered up in any way? Do you think all the information's gotten out? I'm not sure that there's been some evil person lurking back there covering this up, but through the process of the things I've described, this propensity to change stories, lie to cover your backside, that yes, the end result was that, it, that it, the true actual facts in this case have not yet been developed. Do you think we've made some progress, but we've more, got more to go? Some progress, I beg you to narrow the issues and ask these witnesses questions and get it out right here. And one thing I would like for you to ask for, though, it just came through my mind. I wonder if the ATF prepared a press release for what would happen if this raid didn't blow up in everybody's face. You know, they had that PR table there. I bet you they had a prepared press release. I would, the judge in Waco wouldn't let us ask for it because he thought it was immaterial, but it's not immaterial to you folks. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe, maybe we'll pursue that. Mrs. Sparks. Tell us about the coordination that you had with the FBI, or was it ATF concerning CS gas, or was it both? It was an ATF agent that I spoke with from the command post. ATF uh, agent, tell us about that. Um, he called. We talked about the plan. I asked him what kind of protective clothing my staff would wear, what kind of effect it was going to have on the children and my staff. Um, we, we discussed it in, at some length. There was going to be medical personnel and on-site showers. How, how far in advance was this before the... the uh, I'm, I, d I couldn't find my handwritten notes, but what I remember is like the end of March. End of March. And so that was pretty well decided way in advance then, or was it? Well, what, what we were told was he called me back at 5.30 and said, D you know, Forget yeah. it. We're, don't even think about it. And what we assumed was that they had decided it was too dangerous. On, on all the, uh, you, you seem to have had a fairly good rapport with David. At least you could talk to him. He understood you. You understood him. You were able to get into some limited degree to see the children. Did you see uh, cases of sanitation, abuse, uh, bad sanitary conditions? Uh, just describe what you saw. Yes, there was no running water and no indoor plumbing. And so they had big buckets that they were using the bathroom in and then they, would, they said they buried it after that. But there were concerns. Uh, there had been some <clears throat> hepatitis B uh, infection and there were just 
real concerns, no running water and no bathroom facilities. We thank you. Um, in closing this, uh, this day of oversight hearings, uh, I guess it's actually the third day in the events at Waco, I must say that we've learned a lot. We've seen documents that show uh, Secretary Benson had a memo in his possession that uh, stated on April 15th, uh, four days before the fire, that killed 80 Americans and 22 children, that, and I quote, the risk of a tragedy are there, and if the FBI waits indefinitely, Mr. Koresh will eventually concede. Second, we have seen uh, brand new Justice Departments that uh, now show clearly, uh, they indicate uh, several incidents of what uh, have now been described in testimony as obstruction of justice relating to the Waco uh, shooting review and, and the uh, Brady evidence. Third, the FBI canceled the CS gas follow-up and precautions of children regarding Mrs. Sparks only days before the CS was used with deadly results. Fourth, Mr. Higgins was aware of the new fact which we now have in a document that we, um, uh, that's involving a startling quote uh, in quote, embarrassment to Secretary Benson was the real reason Treasury considered calling off the raid. Finally, um, uh, Mr. Morrison said, and I quote, uh, the element of surprise was critical, yet the raid went forward without it. In closing, we're three days into our eight days, and I, for one, am now better educated a little bit on Waco, but also deeply troubled. There is an awful lot left to come out. There's a lot that has been thrown us, tried to throw us off, um, a lot of coordinated damage control going on. The truth is still our goal. The truth is still our aim. And I make no apologies. We're going to be totally committed to get to the bottom of this. I thank you all, and I would like to give Mr. Coleman, who is the minority witness, who is one person that hasn't had a chance at all to say, I don't think the minority would disagree, but since he's come this distance, uh, if you have a minute or so, would, any comment that you'd like to make? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that greatly. Uh, I've been here in Washington for seven days waiting to testify, and I hoped that I might be able to shed some light to perhaps allay some of your concerns and fears based upon my experience in law enforcement tactical operations and my independent review of what transpired outside of Waco, Texas on February 28th, 1993. Uh, let me just say that I retired in 1987 after 26 years of law enforcement experience, nine of which were spent with the tactical unit as both a SWAT team leader and later as a SWAT commander uh, in overall charge of all eight of the department SWAT teams at that time. I had occasion over the years to work with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms many, many times. I have always found them to be a highly dedicated professional group of men and women who, in my opinion, do an extremely different, difficult job very well. Uh, I don't see this based upon my review of uh, the countless documents and videotape and other documents that were provided to the panelists to review as any kind of a conspiracy to fail. These are professional men and women. Were there deficiencies in the operation? Absolutely. But to their credit, to their credit, ATF has done everything within their power, in my opinion, to accept the recommendations of the review and the panelists and have taken very positive steps to change for the better. I think what they need from this committee and the American people are their support. I think there has been a lot of misinformation in these hearings. I just wish that I would have had an opportunity to help you clarify them, but whether I'm uh, whether I was on the wrong panel or people just didn't like me and didn't want to ask questions, I don't know. Well, I certainly like you because that's why I gave you the opportunity to respond. Uh, I was very kind of you. We, I, I'll tell you, frankly, it's a very difficult task that we have before us. I don't think there's anybody on either side of the aisle here that doesn't have anything but the ab absolute top respect for our law enforcement uh, folks that uh, deal with us and our safety day in and day out. And, and, uh, on, can let me just finish? Uh, and and uh, what we're dealing with here is where mistakes made and could be at the highest levels. It could be at the management. There's many, many loyal people just doing what they are told to do uh, and, and, and their willingness to serve and give us their commitment. And in four cases, uh, four ATFs died in their commission and commitment to service. 
And so out of respect for them, out of respect for our country and the balance of power and the role of oversight, the fact that no one's above the law, I think what these hearings are trying to do very desperately is to get at the bottom of what really happened. Somehow, if there was that mistakes were made, I think the American people are very forgiving. They will forgive those mistakes. Let's fix the problem. If there is a problem, let's go on and close the book. Let's then have the credibility back in place for our law enforcement. That's what we need. That's our goal as well. These hearings now conclude at the end of the third. Go ahead. Mr. Coleman has indicated both to me and to you that he obviously has something he wants to get off his chest. Now, I realize people want to catch planes. I would ask, in fairness, that he be given unanimous consent to put his statement, whatever that statement is, in the record. Since, since we are in a hurry to go catch planes and get back to our homes. Without objection, so order. I assume that all of them heard this, and, and, and you may have been out of the room. Uh, everybody's statements are included in the record, and any material that anybody would like to include. Uh, so without objection, so ordered. Uh, the hearing is adjourned. We will re-adjourn, uh, re-convene uh, at uh, Monday morning at 9.30. Is it 10? Hey, sorry, it's 10 o'clock. The Waco investigation hearings continue Monday. This weekend, you can see this week's hearings later this morning at 8 Eastern Time on our companion network C-SPAN 2. And Monday, when the hearings resume, we'll show them to you Monday night here on C-SPAN at 10 p.m. Eastern Time.